heart for a long time in terms of the body coming together and just celebrating before the Lord and just inviting the Lord to do what he wants to do with us and in us and through us and cord of three strands is not easily broken. Amen. Just some uh, housekeeping matters before we get started. Um, you know, if, if, first of all, there's like fruit all over. And if you see a half-eaten piece of fruit, would you mind picking it up and throwing it in a trash can? <laughs> Chances are that one's done. And, uh, we just want to kind of keep, just, we just want to keep things picked up and uh, keep it nice. <laughs> um, just ask you just to kind of watch your things. Um, isn't this amazing, this place amazing? These pews got brought in this week. We don't even, we don't even know where they came from. We were here setting up the tent and, and all, all these guys come in with pews and we start helping and it was just, it's kind of cool the way the Lord has just kind of collided everything and things have kind of pulled together. And Dave McClellan fixed their lights. And that was a blessing, you know. So, <laughs> I mean, it's just cool stuff. I love it when things like that happen. But uh, anyway, um, so I just want to just ask you, just kind of, let's just keep it picked up and everything. I think there's trash cans here and there. There's a dumpster out here. If somebody sees a trash can that's overflowing, hey, just don't at, wait for somebody to ask you. Just take it out. And we'll try to keep things taken care of, okay? Um, also, um, just want to ask you to please be careful about children. we got some children running around. There's a little playground back here. But as you're parking and you're pulling out, pulling in, please be very, very careful. And uh, just be watchful. You know, we don't want to mess things up um, the bathrooms are in the building next door facing out you can see that they're unlocked it's a nice thing we're gonna have some worship here for a while then we're gonna share the word a little bit and then we're gonna have a feast right out here at the tent at two o'clock and a barbecue big barbecue and uh, somebody asked if there were, if it was if there was a cost for that there's no cost um, later, there should be a basket at the back if you want to contribute to give offerings to everything and uh, to Terry. And so there'd be opportunity for that. I'm not quite sure how Troy's handling all that, but uh, I'm sure he'll give us some more information later. But mostly, um, I just pray that um, this morning that you just really allow the Lord to just to go deeper into your heart. You know, Terry's not speaking this morning, but there was there's still a, a deep purpose in what we're doing. We're, we are we're really plowing ground this morning to make room for the word tonight. I'm not saying that the word isn't significant this morning, but I'm just saying that that we wanted to do this thing on Saturday the whole day just to give us time to go up, to touch the Lord, to go out and touch one another, and to make a place for God to pour out the oil of the new covenant. The new covenant is the ultimate wineskin. The new covenant, what God does between me and you by his spirit, that is the ultimate wineskin. That is what's going to draw the, the nets of revival in. It's the... It really is the net that's going to pull in the harvest. And so it's, it's um, we're just trying to, in a sense, sow into that dynamic this morning. So I just, um, just want to invite you just to allow the Lord to expand your tent pegs this morning, expand your heart. Um, we always, we like to talk about the anointing of the feast. And, uh, you know, we had the Feast of Tabernacles was just finished. And we always found, we used to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles over in eastern Idaho. And we used to find that God gave us an enormous capacity to take in the Word. So I want to challenge you this morning, and we're gonna, I'm going to offer this challenge tonight, 
to don't stop thinking this is too much. We are here this weekend to open our hearts as broadly as we possibly can and then to ask for the Holy Spirit to take us further, to take in absolutely as much of the Word of God, this, as much of the seed of God's Word as we possibly can and immeasurably beyond that. Do not say it's too much. Just don't go there. That's that's the, the mind of Adam. Let's come into the mind of Christ. You have an infinite capacity to grow. Uh, God is breaking limits. In Jesus Christ, he set new boundaries for mankind. I don't know if you understand that. Adam's boundaries were restricted. Christ broke all the boundaries. And, and so we are pressing into this boundless realm called Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what Terry talked about all last night. We think that if we only go to Jesus, we restrict ourselves. I am telling you that is the biggest lie in the earth, in the universe. Because Jesus is the door into every realm that ever existed. And so go through, go through the gates, people of God. <laughs> Let's go through the gates. Jesus the Lord. Hallelujah. So. Uh, anyway, the fruit is out. You're welcome to it. It's for you. It's part of the feast. We're going to eat it too. It's part of the feast. We're going to eat tonight. We're going to eat this morning. It's part of the feast. We are receiving the abundance of the Lord. Isaiah 55 says, listen carefully to me and delight yourself in abundance. Isn't that powerful? So why don't we just obey the word? Amen. Let's delight ourselves in abundance. Hallelujah. My very precious friend Jen Gardner is here and Ron is on the drums. He's amazing. Paul and Nick and Molly and Melissa are somewhere. Kevin's over here just friends from Twin Falls, have friends from Blackfoot, Eastern Idaho, Pocatello, Idaho Falls, praise God. We have friends from Jerome and Twin Falls all across the southern state, southern part of Idaho. There is something happening in terms of the binding of the Lord. The point, God is preparing a body for himself. That's the theme of this morning. A body you have prepared for me. So, let's be it. Amen? All right. Hi, Missy. There's a place up here for you. All right. All right. Any word about the kids, Suzanne? Okay. Kids, you're welcome. We're not going to worry worry about them. And, I mean, worry about them in the wrong way. We'll, we'll, we'll watch over them. As you worship, watch the kids. And, yeah, good enough. Okay, Jenny, bless you. I guess we should pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, we bow before your majesty and your holiness. We invite you, Lord, to come and exalt the name of Jesus, to glorify your Son in our midst. Lord Jesus, we invite you to declare the name of the Father in our midst. Holy Spirit, we invite you to pull back the veil. Lord, we just ask you, Lord, escort us in. Escort us deeper. Escort us into the wideness of your mercy. Lord, let us experience what true deliverance is all about. True freedom in Christ. 
to be bound to you. The fullness of you who fill everything. Who fill all in all. Hallelujah. Be glorified, Lord God, in your midst of your people. We welcome you, Lord. We invite you to do whatever is in your heart. Lord, draw us up close to you. Draw us near. Grace us, Lord. Release your anointing that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Cause us to come up to see you as you really are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your King. 
rise and when we fall All eyes on you, oh humble one You live for our applause
to proclaim your worth when I gave from my debts when I poured out when I gave to you what's costly it put my faith on fire it reminded me of all your worth what can I give what can I do what can I pour out that's costly this new place I am in this new season what can I give that's costly Remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, and now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And the beasts of the field will honor me, and the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. Yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. And I will pour my spirit upon your descendants. 
and my blessing on your offspring that they will spring up among the grass like willows by the water courses one will say I, I am the Lord's and another will call himself by the name of Jacob and another will write on with his hand I belong to God and the name and name himself by the name of Israel Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from the time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one.
high-tech microphone we do not have microphones of this caliber at my church this has neon lights on it father I just bless you this morning I just join in the prayer of your son and say Lord you are the glorious father you're the righteous father Lord, everything that comes from you is good and right and true and holy, and full of light and full of love and full of peace and kindness. You're full of patience, steadfast love and mercy. They kiss in you. Father, I bless your name. You are the Father of life and light. There's no shadow of turning, not even the hint of turning back your gaze from us, Lord. You're beautiful. I love the sun that sits at your right hand. Jesus, you're beautiful. Lord, you're worthy. I bless you this morning, Lord. I love you this morning, Jesus. Invite your presence. We love you, Lord. Thank you for the offering, the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. I was pierced this morning in my heart. As Molly was singing this morning, my wife Jen's playing the piano, and then Molly, she's one of the prophetic singers at our church. I was pierced in my heart. The Lord in His grace, I'm always asking for a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. I always pray Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. And uh, sometimes the spirit of revelation uncovers things that I'm uncomfortable with in my own heart. And I have a way of being on fire. That's my way of being on fire. And sometimes the Lord uncovers things in my heart that I'm reluctant to give Him because it doesn't look like the way I'm on fire. And this morning with Molly singing and she was singing she was saying <laughs> different seasons require different sacrifices and she was saying Lord what can I give you that's costly in this season and it's just like the spirit of revelation broke my heart Lord that's not the way I'm on fire right now I'm on fire in the word Lord I'm not on fire sacrificially like that. If I'm being honest with myself. Beloved, he's the God of truth. His eyes sift. Right? Proverbs says, man, the king can weigh the wicked with his eyes. He can weigh the righteous too, beloved. He's looking for weight in the church. Psalm 1 declares it. This is the way the righteous are. They're like trees that are planted beside streams of water, right? Their roots go down deep, their branches go up high, they yield fruit in season, not so the wicked, they're like chaff. There's no weight in them, therefore they cannot stand in the judgment. The Lord sifts us and looks at us, and he's honest with us. Scare me now, Lord. Don't scare me later. And I was just writing in my journal. I just said, Lord, what do I have of worth right now? What does the Lord your God require of you, Micah 6, 8? And I always quote that to my own self in my own prayer life. I felt like the Lord said, what does the Lord your God require of you? Kevin, you know what the Lord requires of you, beloved? 
He requires that which is costly. Is time tight? I want your time. Is money an issue? I want your money. Is your heart cold toward your wife? I want your loving devotion toward her. Is your heart cold toward me? I want your devotion. Nothing counts but faith working through love. Listen to me. The heart that's baptized in love, that's in the stretch of faith, is beautiful to God. Amen? You know where Jesus is at? That Sunday or Saturday morning when people are offering sacrifices in the temple? Jesus' eyes are beamed in on an elderly young an elderly young lady. He's looking at two pennies going in. What a waste. Doesn't he know that temple's going to be destroyed in just a couple years, 70 AD? And she's contributing to the building fund. Jesus is the wisdom and knowledge of God. He knows these things. Why doesn't he cut her off and say, do something that's more effective with your money, beloved? Put it in the apostle and put it at the apostle's feet. He wasn't looking at that. He was looking at her heart. God notices the extremity behind the extravagance. And I'm going to say that because God gave me that and I liked it and I wrote it down. Do you remember when that lady is offering a costly sacrifice at Jesus' feet? It's repeated in all four Gospels. Mark 14, Matthew 26, Luke 7, John 11. Some woman that busts something out and breaks it over his feet. And what do the apostles say? Why the waste? Why the waste, Jesus? She could have done something much more productive with this money. We could have built an orphanage, Lord. Jesus said, she has done a beautiful work for me. Faith operating in love is beautiful to God. It's lovely to Him. It's the only expression that's worthy of Him. When it costs you everything, it's beautiful to the Lord. Do you remember? Remember when David took a census, 2 Samuel, chapter 24 or so? Do you remember that? David sinned against the Lord and took a census. And you remember the angel of the Lord appeared with his mighty sword drawn over Jerusalem? And David was smoked. And David laid in the dust. And the Lord said, I gave you three options, right? Right offhand, I'll probably butcher it. I haven't read that story in months. I could either, you know, have this plague. I can wipe out 70,000 people now. Something else can happen. I can let a foreign army invade. This and that. It's going to take some weeks. Or the other thing's going to take some months. David said, I don't want anything but what comes from your hand. I don't trust men, but I know that you're merciful. I know this because I've been singing it in the house of prayer for years. That steadfast loving kindness is yours. I don't understand the whole angel with the sword right now. But I'm going to revert back to the loving kindness of God endures forever. And all the people said, after every verse David sings, his love endures forever. Beloved, David had a history in God. He knew that. And he said, men aren't merciful, but I know that you are. And then his brother Ornan, right? They're in the field of Ornan. Onan. Ornan. His brother is thankful for his name. His mom gave him. The field of Ornan. And he said, hey, I've got everything you need, David. David said this, I will not offer to the Lord anything that does not cost me everything. It has to cost me something. I know the beauty realm of God, and I know that it has to cost us something. Did you know in the early church, beauty was a test of orthodoxy? It has to be beautiful. It's, it's paradox, intention. The, the ultimately, heresy tries to make orthodoxy tame, and it cannot. It tries to take the mystery out of it. Beloved, it's beautiful to God that when you have nothing, you offer everything. Yeah. Remember that, what is it, 2 Corinthians 8? Remember Paul praised them because out of their, the abundance of their poverty, they gave joyfully. He knew it was a work of the Holy Spirit. Out of nothing, they gave everything. And that preaches well. Gosh, I should, whew, should use that tomorrow. 
Except that the Holy Spirit didn't say, Kevin, preach this. The Holy Spirit said, Kevin, do this. <sighs> Amen. Jesus said, how, how do you get there? Remember that in Luke 7? They said, they're like, how is this lady pouring out everything that she has? Lord, I don't understand. She's been forgiven much. She loves much. He said, this, this is a beautiful thing to me. He said, it won't be taken away from her. Remember what he said then? Remember they got on her case and he said, leave her alone. Beloved, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm a, I'm a child of this television generation. But in my mind, when Jesus says, leave her alone, it's like, boom. <laughs> it's like a force field around that young lady. You know what I mean? All hell knows when Jesus says, leave her alone. There's a divine, I believe, a commanded blessing when you operate in that place of love, faith all over love. I love, but I don't have it. I don't have anything to do with that. I can't give that. I don't have that. But I'm going to step out of the boat. I'm going for this. Leave him alone. I have to believe that money comes from somewhere when I do that. I have to believe I step out of my faith into the faith of Jesus. Something happens when your love can tells you to do something uncomfortable. God sees the extremity behind the extravagance and he knows your history. He knows you don't have the money. He's fully aware of that. Amen? Amen. There was something else I was going to say about all that and it was profound. And you guys are going to miss it because I forgot. Amen. He makes us beautiful. So Lord, I'm just gonna, I just want to release that on my own heart. I'm going to just repent of my cowardice. Lord, I just want to ask you right now for a spirit of courage like that young man Yeshua had all over him. He just stand in the temple and say, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Looking at a crowd of angry young men ready to rip him apart, going to throw him off the edge of the mountain. And Jesus just says, I'm fully engaged with the will of the Father. I'm not moved by my circumstances or fear or pride. Taking on the form of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man, I'm going to humble myself, become obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because it's beautiful. Because it's extravagant. Because it's going to cost me everything to the glory of the Father. Lord, I just ask for the release of that grace of an extravagant, overflowing cup and an abundant heart. I have no lack because I have you. Amen? I just want to break off that poverty deal I get on me sometimes where I can't give because I'm broke. Jesus, if God has given me his son, will he not with him graciously give me all things? Father, I just repent of my lack of faith. God, my cowardice. I <laughs> said, receive the fullness of who you are right now. Christ in me is the hope of glory, and I can do everything through him who gives me strength. In Jesus' name, let it be. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Wow, the children have worshipped. <laughs> yeah, and they're all asleep now. You know when children worship, it puts them at rest. You know, God, God is never offended by a child. We get offended by children, but God never gets offended. So bless his name. Thank you so much, Jenny. And Molly and Paul and Ron and Kevin. That was Kevin Gardner, by the way, my precious friend from Twin Falls. They have a ministry over there called Dwelling Place. And uh, it's good. You know, when we started this morning, I exhorted you to extravagance. I exhorted you to delight yourself in abundance. But most of us are not used to lingering long at the table of the Lord. 
many of us quit long before the Lord is ready to quit. Do you know what? Do you know that it's you? The only time you waste time, the only time you lose time, is when you're out of the will of God. Do you think about this? That as long as you're in the will of God, you have eternity. You will never run out of time if you are in the will of God. Because, in, because the will of God is to be in Christ. And Christ is timeless. By the power of an eternal life, a limitless life, he entered into the order of Melchizedek. Not because of his genealogy, but, but by the power of an eternal life, he entered into the order of Melchizedek. And that order of Melchizedek, that high priesthood of Jesus, expands the realms. Every boundary that you've ever known in yourself is broken in Christ. Including what Jesus, uh, Kevin just exhorted us to, this boundary of poverty. A poverty spirit is a spirit that's in, out of Adam. It's not in Christ. Amen? I feel like that our, our assignment this morning is to open realms so we can just turn Terry loose tonight. I want you to think about this. You know, we're not assuming, uh, this, this brother brings an ex a huge anointing, and believe me, beloved, it's not, he doesn't go skipping through the park with it. It's a burden that he carries. We, one of the things that we've been praying for months is that this ground would be prepared for when he came. We started praying every week, 12, about a dozen of us, 15 of us, July 1st, every Monday, the last six weeks we've been here every Monday just to pray into the ground that there would be something to receive a people to receive the word. A body you have prepared for me. Hebrews 13, 5, or 10, 5, excuse me. A body you have prepared for me. And we have been praying into the body that will receive the word. Because, beloved, it's not enough that we hear an amazing message. We have to have something prepared to receive it. In the parable of the sower, the seed went out. The seed was the word of God, but only one type of soil was actually able to accommodate the seed and bring forth fruit. First the blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. Right? Mark 4, I think it's Mark 4.38. just want you to look at this for a second. By the way, my name is Brian. 4.28. So about the parable of the, uh, the, the sower in the kingdom, the growing seed. Verse 26 and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed in the ground, on the ground. It should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. And he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. And when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the Feast of Tabernacles and about things coming into fullness. There are three major feasts of Israel, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, and they represent a growth of the Word of God in a people. Passover represents when we come to faith in Christ. Pentecost is when we get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, an empowerment for witness, an empowerment of gifting. But Tabernacles is the feast of the harvest. It is first the blade, 
than the head, than the full grain in the head. It is about us coming into fullness. You did not get everything that you wanted in God when you got baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls that in Ephesians chapter 1, the era bone, the down payment. It's, it's the first fruits, it's, or the, it's the beginning. But you are meant to come into fullness. And um, Kevin was mentioning a few moments ago that we're, it's almost like we're afraid of mystery. But the only way to come into fullness is to walk in the mysteries. The mysteries are not the peripheral f things of the faith. They're at the core of it. The mystery of Christ. The mystery of godliness. The great mystery of uh, Terry talked about it last night of the Christ and the bride, or the, of the bride and her husband. This is speaking about Christ and his church. These are not peripheral things. These are the core issues. We think, wow, well, it's a mystery. It's kind of like beyond me. I'm not going to mess with that. I'll just stick with salvation. When you stick with salvation, you get the blade. You don't get the head. You don't get the full grain in the head. But God has released his power, released his grace to bring a church into fullness. But what happens so often is we have dumbed down the gospel. We've reduced it, shrunk it down so that we don't make room for the fullness to come in. Because we basically said that's beyond our ability or that will happen in heaven, but that can never happen on the earth. But beloved, in this hour, what even what last night, I don't, how many of you were here last night? Most everybody, most everybody. Terry was plowing, plowing, plowing. And, I, and to bring a word. And every once in a while, he would break out. And just like within 15 seconds, bam, 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 bam. And then it would pull back. And I'm thinking, let's scoot up to the table let's belly up to the bar and let's begin to eat let's begin to ask God to expand our capacity in him to receive because beloved I mean if, if Terry comes and he has all this stuff to give but there's no place to pour it out where's it going to go it won't come there has there must be, there, the Bible talks about a famine of the hearing of the Word of God. Not just a famine of the speaking of the Word, the fa famine of the hearing. The Word is pregnant in a vessel, but there's no place to pour it out. So, if Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, if you'll, if you'll turn there, the, the, the author of Hebrews Put quotes from uh, Psalm chapter 40 and he puts these words in Jesus' mouth. He's speaking of Jesus the high priest who's come into a new place. He says, therefore, he, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Suffering and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now that's a mouthful. But what it's saying is that Jesus came to establish a new covenant. And that he came to basically remove the limits of the law by establishing a new boundary of righteousness. Jesus did, submitted to the law, but he went beyond the law in righteousness. I want to read just a journaling from my wife a few days ago. 
I just want you to think in terms of Jesus establishing a new boundary. Because in Jesus, your boundaries begin to lose their limits. Jesus went beyond the law in righteousness. He went to the core of it. Establish boundaries for righteousness. To him in, to him in and to keep out. There are boundaries both individually and corporately. A wave on the sea has a boundary. Its scope is limited at the shore. This can only be overwritten by great force. So it is with righteousness. There is a natural boundary that can only be surpassed when a great force compels it. This is what my firstborn son did. He pushed the boundaries of personal righteousness. Now is the time for my sons to push the boundaries of corporate righteousness. You must refuse to go alone. You must look beyond the boundary. You must yield to my hand when great force builds up behind you. And then you must flow wherever the Spirit takes you. If you ride on the crest of the wave, you will move faster and farther. So go for it and see where you end up. You won't know what you won't. You'll, yeah, you'll know when you get there, but not until. That's called the mystery. The Holy Spirit was sent by Jesus to lead us into the fullness of Jesus. Hebrews chapter eleven, verse two, says, "By the word of God, He framed the world." But guess what? He didn't fill the world. He framed it. And then what did he tell Adam and Eve to do? Fill it. First the blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. It's tabernacles. The original commandment to Adam, the original commission, was to bring the earth into fullness. By the word of God, the worlds were framed. By the word of God becoming incarnate in you and me, the worlds are filled. Now here is, now Adam, when Adam fell, he put a cap on manhood's capacity. Not only his capacity to do and to create and to do, to do, to move beyond boundaries, but even he put a cap on his capacity to experience joy, peace, love. Because when man walks in fear, he pulls himself back. He puts himself back behind a boundary. Self-protection will not allow him to pour out. And so now Adam is covering himself. Now he's doesn't have freedom in his relationship with his wife. Now he's hiding from God. And because of that, he cannot move into fullness. Beloved, it's only until we begin to engage the Lord again that the restraints begin to be thrown off of us. Now all in Adam die. I call that a restraint. All in Christ shall be made alive. I call that a lifting of restraints. And there, hear, hear it again. I said, when you are in the will of God, you have eternity to do it. When you're out of the will of God, your time is limited. As a matter of fact, your time is ticking away. And beloved, what I want to say to you today is that there's only one issue for you today, and that is to get into the will of God. That is to submit and abide in Christ. Because when you're abiding in Christ, God is looking at you to begin to abide in you. 
Beloved, I'm not, this is, this is just like so simple. It's so simple. It, I, we've been saying this for months, that the, the, earth, the church is complicated and shallow. But God wants us to be simple and deep. If we'll come back to Christ, the center and the core of everything, beloved, that is a limitless realm. Absolutely limitless. So this morning, we lingered long in the worship. We sang songs. We sang words over and over again. Why? Because that's what meditation is. Meditation is about unpacking the meanings of words. The, unpacking the meanings of what is being spoken to us. And every time she would go back, just a little while longer and I'll see you. Ah! I just like go deep. I just, whoa! You just take me someplace. You just, whoa! And, I, and I've, we've come to learn that we, we, do, we do theology in the spirit realm. We do it in this place called worship. We do it in the house of prayer. We've said it for years. Your prayer closet is the biggest room in your house, or it should be. Why? Because in the place of prayer, in the house of prayer, you engage eternity. You engage the realm. You begin to peer into possibilities. What God has, what man has not seen, what he hasn't heard, what has yet to enter into the heart of man, all these things God has provided for those who love him. But how are those places accessed? Only by the Spirit. And you know why the enemy fights this speaking in tongues and going into the things of the Spirit? We want everything in the natural. The enemy fights it. Why? If, if he keeps you out in the natural, he can control you. But if you, if you go into the Spirit, he can't. He can't get his hands on you. Now you're moving in mysteries. Now That's our domain, not the enemy's domain. He does not have access to the mysteries. He's never had, he doesn't have a creative bone in his body. The enemy only can mimic what he sees the church doing and then he twists it. But I, I'm telling you, God is going to provoke darkness through his church. Darkness will be rising, but it's because the church is rising. The church rising puts fear in the heart of the enemy. But it puts delight in the heart of God. I would rather focus on the delight than on the fear. Because when God is delighted, just like Kevin told us, God defends his own. God puts a bubble around him. Leave her alone. Leave him alone. And so, beloved, this place where we just, where we just went and worship. I mean, we just touched the hem of his garment. That's all. But beloved, if we, when we learn to linger long in that place, then time ceases to be an issue. Because now we're obe ob abiding. And beloved, I'm not telling you that we're just supposed to sit in the feet of Jesus all the time and never do anything practical. That's not what this is about. This is about our worship becoming something that satisfies God instead of satisfying ourselves. Well, wait a second. You know, it's like 11 o'clock. We've got we to gotta go on to the Word now. It's like, what if when we're gathered together and God's just saying, man, I'm really enjoying this. Are you, are you, really? You're going to quit to talk? You're going you're gonna to stop doing what you're doing so that, I, so, the, so that people don't get upset and get offended because you're going too long? Really? And to see, this is the whole thing, is that when does the church become, it's, its only passion is to serve the Lord. What, hallelujah. Amen. I, I don't care if you amen. I won't. Um, amen. Hey. And so, so what, is, what does Jesus say? A body you have prepared for me. A body you have prepared for me. I believe God is looking at this region and saying to the Father, a body you've prepared for me. 
What is God looking for? He's looking for his counterpart. He's looking for the inverse reflection of himself. He's looking for a people who carry his burden, who carry his heart, the things that he loves, they love, the things he hates, they hate. It says in Psalm 45, you loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you. Jesus submitted to the word. He submitted to the truth. And God filled it with himself. By, by the truth, by the word, the worlds were framed. By the word of God, you were framed. Do you know what you, what you do when you put the word of God in your heart? You make room for God to do something amazing. You're making a place for him to operate. It's the word and faith in that word set in us. What did, you, what did God say? Where is the house you're going to build me? Where is the place of my rest? He, he looks at the earth. All, all these things my hands have made. Where's the house you're going to build me? But to this one will I look. To him who is humble and contrite and who trembles at my word. Now, if you want to build a house for the devil, believe lies. Because Satan lives in the refuge of lies. You believe a lie, you put out a welcome mat for the enemy to manipulate you. You believe the truth, you're making room for God to move in your midst. Jesus, by the word of the Lord, the earth was framed. The world, creation, was framed, but not filled. First the blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. God wants to manifest his son in us and through us. And so... In this place where we were, where we were going a few moments ago, just in, in the worship, we call that the Tabernacle of David. The Tabernacle of David. Can you imagine David sitting, singing, and then he overhears a conversation, and then he starts singing about it. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being in that place when that word came forth from the Father to the Son before the Son was ever born? David, David moved beyond the old covenant into the new because he pressed into that realm, into the mysteries, and stepped into a place. Look at this, this passage in Hebrews chapter 10. It's quoting another passage in Psalm chapter 40. Let's look at that for a minute. Chapter 40, verse 6 through 7. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. You did not. My ears you have opened. Burn offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come, in the scroll of the book it's written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Think about that. David from the Old Covenant is saying these things. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Literally, it means to dig out. My ears you have dug out. What was, what was Terry saying last night? Do you remember when he kind of went off at one moment? We got to get the dirt out of our ears. Do you understand that when we're dull of hearing, we cannot hear God inviting us to the supper. When we're dull of hearing, we, we just, we, we, we get, become satisfied with limitations. With, oh, it will never happen. 
We began to walk in doubt, in fear, in unbelief, in stinginess, in a poverty spirit. That is dullness of hearing. If you're not walking in faith, in radical love, you're dull of hearing. Because to be, to, to be truly, to be alive to God is to hear and to move. And so he began to look at his life, but he was in the house of prayer, and he engaged a realm. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. It's almost like, oh my gosh, I finally get it. My ears you've opened. Burn offering, sin offering, you did not require. And then I said, what is it you want? Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book, it's written of me. Am I scaring that little girl? Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Grandma, come back here. <laughs> in the scroll of the book, it's written of me. I delight to do your will, and your word is in my heart. What All of a sudden, David said, there's something burning inside of me that's outside of the law. It's beyond it. The law is on the outside, but this is something from the inside. It is a work of God internally. I'm going to submit to it. I'm going to go with it. I, I feel the word of God stirring up in me. My ears you have opened. Then I said, Behold, I come. What is God looking for? He's just looking for us. In the scroll of the book, it's written of me. What does that mean? That means that the very word of God writes out my destiny. I'm finding my purpose, my dimensions, who I am. The word of God is framing me. In the scroll of the book, it's written of me. The outline of my personal life is in the scriptures. I'm going, I'm, I'm going beyond, this is beyond law. I'm going to let the word find, be germinated in my heart. His word is in my heart. But it's interesting that here in Isaiah, in Psalm 40, it says, my ears you have opened. But in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, a body you've prepared for me. Now what's up with that? Why does it misquote it? Well actually the Hebrew text says my ears you have opened or dug out. But the Septuagint which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text it says a body you have prepared for me. And the author of Hebrews uses the Septuagint to quote it. He quotes the Septuagint, which is a different translation. A body you've prepared for me, but think about it. When God opens the ears, it's like it makes preparation for a work to be done. And my ears you have opened is one realm. A body you have prepared for me is another. It's just a progression. The ear becomes extended to the whole body. So when you begin to hear, suddenly you begin to be a place where God deposits his word and fullness comes. From the ear, which is a part, that's the gate through which the seed comes in and begins to manifest itself in the whole body. So it's a progression. Here's the amazing thing. In the book of Hebrews, the author of the book of Hebrews puts this scripture in the language, in the mouth of Jesus. Jesus is saying this. And Jesus is saying, my body, I have you have prepared for me, Lord, and I'm offering it back to you. And so it's been offered up, a, a sacrifice. But now let's move even beyond that. Because the body God is now preparing for the Lord Jesus is all of us. A body he has prepared. Why? Because God wants the word of God to find germination in our heart and to become incarnate. To be fully expressed through a people, a corporate people. Suzanne journaled about individual righteousness moving to corporate 
righteousness. What did Jesus say? Unless a seed falls in the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And so God is saying, I'm looking for more. I'm looking for more. God is looking for maturity. But beloved, maturity is something that comes not because we work real hard at it, but because we learn to abide in the Word. If my Word abides in you, you will be disciples of mine. The Word is imperishable. Do you know that Jesus allowed the Word of God to frame His life? Do you know that Jesus studied the Scriptures to have an understanding about Himself? In Luke chapter 4, He stands up and reads Isaiah 61. This day, this Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He allowed... Jesus understood His resurrection from the dead by the Word. He saw the resurrection in the Scripture. And then he believed it, and then he began to prophesy his own resurrection. Jesus raised himself from the dead by prophetic word. He prophesied his resurrection. That's Gina Collins' revelation, by the way. But he prophesied his destiny because he submitted to the word. And beloved, when the church begins to hear and feel the fullness, whoops, the fullness of all that God has intended. It begins to see it, believe it, declare it, step into it. We're going to come into fullness. We are preparing. We are a body thou hast prepared for him. Now, beloved, look at us. Here we are from all across of southern Idaho. There's not a lot of us here, but that's pretty good. How many are from Eastern Idaho here today? Stand up just for a minute. Eastern, from Burley over. Yeah. Pocatello North, fine. Okay, very nice. Okay, you may be seated. Thank you for coming. How many are from Jerome Twin Falls? And in that area, the Magic Valley, okay, another wonderful group. Welcome. How many are from the Treasure Valley? Can you stand? All right. Wow. You know, you would think you would think most of us would be from here. And I guess it, we are, but So, beloved, it's not, again, it's not in trying hard. It's learning to abide. If you abide in my, if my word abides in you, you are, you will be disciples of mine. You will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. See, this becomes something internalized. You become a plumb line in yourself. God brings fullness to you by his presence in your life. And so, again, I'm not, I'm just trying to say, let's submit to the word of God. Let's let, the, let's let what God declares about his church, let it be in us. Let it fill us. Let, us, let it fill us with hope, with encouragement. Be strengthened. Now, Terry has spoken about the fact that we're going to, we're going to war. Um, you know, a lovesick bride doesn't even think about it. Which it's just like the lovesickness pulls us deeper, t- causes us to pursue the bride. In in the book of Song of Songs, they the, the young maidens ask the um, the bride in in that book what is this one above all the others why are you so enamored why do you keep pushing boundaries 
Why do you keep moving out of conventionality? Why do you, why do you, why do you just push the boundaries all the time? Because, you know, she's running out in the streets and the watchman beat her up. And she goes, it's like she doesn't even care. She goes, hey, if you see my lover, tell him I'm lovesick. She, like, it's like, I can't stay behind the, the fence. A force greater than the force that holds things back propels you into a deeper righteousness, a deeper love sickness. You become abandoned to the one whom your soul loves. And what God is doing is he's lifting all these restrictions that you can go as deep in love as you have the courage to go. You can go as far as you want to go because the Feast of Tabernacles is not about holding back. It's about delighting in abundance. It's about coming to the table. It's about allowing God to tell you everything he wants to tell you. What if we always have to hold back? What if we always having to pull it in because we can't handle it? It's too, the, the, the food is too rich. Okay, well, we're going to turn this into baby food so you can swallow it. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 5. He starts to talk about Melchizedek. He goes, you know, ah, shoot, I wish I could tell you more. But I can't because you're dull of hearing. He says, by now you should be teachers, but you, I'm still having to feed you milk and not solid food. And he says, let us go on to perfection. Let us go on to, to the end. Let us go on to fullness, not laying again these, other found, these elementary principles of Christ. And then he says this in verse 3 of Hebrews 6. This we will do if God permits. And I just want to hang that over this house right now, this collective. If God permits, we're going to go deep tonight. If God permits. But it, won't, it will not be up to Terry. It will be up to the ground that is prepared. It, it will be up to us. Will, are we willing to come and sit at the table and eat everything? When God tells you, I'm going to do extraordinary things through your life, are we going to say, no, no, that, uh, no, that can't happen. You just stopped God. You put a, you, you help God back when he wanted to do extraordinary things. Isaiah chapter 40 says, Let the mountains come low and the valleys be lifted up, the crooked road made straight and the rough road made smooth. Prepare the way of the Lord. What does it mean to prepare the way of the Lord? It means to say this. If you think you're highly of yourself, humble yourself. If you think too lowly of yourself, lift up your head. Because un, un, feeling bad about yourself and not listening to Jesus is as hindering as pride. Let the mountains be brought low. Let the valleys be lifted up. But the crooked road be straight. I can't find a straight path. I'm just going here, going there. It means be still. And if there's some rough, rough edges on your life, let them be chiseled away. Get into the place of stillness so that God can have the fullness of his way with you. Let him, let him say and do everything that he wants to do. God is breaking the boundaries. And he broke the boundaries of what man could be in Jesus Christ. See, the old boundary was Adam. But the new boundary is the last Adam. That's what Criteria was saying last night. A whole new manhood. A whole new creation. What are the boundaries of manhood? Jesus Christ is the new boundary. And he ever lives to intercede for you. That he might save you to the uttermost. Wow! Bam! The new boundary is Christ.
Christ. Because by the word of the Lord were you framed. And who is the word of God? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your new framework. Well, what can this old, this old goat do? Well, that old goat can't do anything but the new one. can do immeasurably more than we ask or think. The boundaries have been expanded. Tonight, I'm praying that Terry, Terry has limitless boundaries to pour out the revelation in his heart. A body you have prepared for me. My exhortation to you is get your tent pegs stretched out. Get your heart wide open. Let God take off your limits. Let God say what he wants to say. Let's, let's create such an atmosphere that Terry says more than he can, he's ever been able to say. Because why? Because, because the limits are removed. The fences are broken down. Not the fences of righteousness, but the 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 fences of our, of our traditions to say no, no, no when God says all the promises of God are in Him are yes and in Him are amen. Because see, all the promises that God has ever spoken, what He spoke to Abraham, what He spoke to David, they've all been distilled down into Jesus. All the covenants come into one person, Jesus Christ. These, everything is condensed. Everything is thick in Him. All the seed, all the promises, all the word is condensed down into one person, Jesus Christ. And now the life that has been bottled up in him is being dispensed through a people. He is the mediator of the new covenant. He is the mediator of limitless life. He is the high priest of our confession, the architect and builder, the author and perfecter, the high priest and apostle. He sits above us and says, come to my table. Let me pour it out. Let me give you grace. There is grace for this hour, and there's grace for so much more than you can ever ask or think. Learning to come to the table of the Lord and to sit at his feet let Jesus impart to you, impart to you. And listen, if you're abiding in him, you have unlimited time. You do not have to hurry because if you get in a hurry, you're walking in fear. You just are. And it's not fear that's going to cause the word of God to come into fullness in you. It's faith. You're trusting in God. Beloved, you have limitless time. In the will of God, in the will of God, you have unlimited time. I, I, just, I just don't agree with these people who say, well, I've only got about 40 years. No. No. If I die, I'm part of the great cloud of witnesses. I'm still pulling on heaven. I'm still interceding. I'm still believing for things that I've seen in the Spirit. And if I don't fulfill them, my kids darn sure will. They are going to fulfill what I could not fulfill. But guess what? I'm not going to slow down the hand of the baton. I'm going to run as hard and fast as I can go. I'm trying to fulfill. I'm trying to raise the ceiling as high as I know how to do it. By, but not in my own strength. But by, you know, Elijah girded up his loins by the Spirit of the Lord and raced Ahab down the mountain. I want to do these things by the Spirit of the Lord. But I am believing for a great company, a body you have prepared for me. We start holding hands. We start looking into each other by the Spirit. We start knowing each other in Christ. The fellowship is in Christ. God abides in us. We abide in God. Unlimited fellowship. You know, you can only have so many close friends. I used to believe that. Love has no limits. You know what? I, I couldn't, I, I mean, I was like, I was so excited this morning that I spilled jelly 
all over the kitchen floor. Now, now you think about it, how do you spill jelly all over the But I did it. I, I just, I said, man, I got to calm down. But you know what? I was so excited. I was so excited that you Treasure Valley folks were going to get to meet my friends from Eastern Idaho and from Twin Falls and, and Jerome. I, I, I mean, I was just like uh, giddy with joy because, because why? Because God expands my ability to know and to connect with people by the Spirit intimately. And it means something. It's not just, hi, how are you? And maybe I don't have time to say a long conversation. He said there's unlimited time. But, but when I say hi, it doesn't have to be shallow. Even if it's three seconds. Do you understand? We're, we're, it's not complicated, but it's deep. And it's meaningful. And it's, and beloved, when we start caring for one another by the grace of God, we don't have time for it in one sense, in the natural sense, for everybody. But we have spiritual capacities to, co to connect through love with people in a deep way in a short period of time. And my prayer for this gathering, for the feast, is that we would be bound together. That I'm out, I've, We've asked for months, Jesus, pour out the new covenant on this gathering. Let people connect by to the heart to heart. Let it be supernatural. Let it be your work. And you know what? This isn't the only work. There's work all over. We're asking. We're not just asking God to pour it out on this assembly. We're asking Him to pour it out you know, all over Boise, all over the Treasure Valley, all over Southern Idaho, up into Northern Idaho. We have friends up there. We have friends in Washington, Oregon. We have friends all over. God is doing amazing things. And we want him to have plenty of room. I told Troy, he says, what do you want to do? I said, I said, oh, you know when you have your bowl of mashed potatoes and you want to put gravy on it, you got to make that little indent? That's what I want to do. I just want to push down on the mashed potatoes <laughs> to, give, to give a place for the gravy so it doesn't run all over the plate. So I, I hope we've I hope we've made a little room for the gravy. Simple. I don't know that it's deep. Well, we, we tried to make it deep. We pushed as far as we could. <laughs> so Lord Jesus, we just want to pray. You make a big indention in us and pour out, pour, pour out the gravy. Lord, Lord, we just stumble around here tonight, but, but you are the perfection, Jesus. You're the beautiful one. We gaze up into your face and We know something more than what we knew before. And Lord, we want to be a place where heaven and earth come together. A body you have prepared for me. Where Jesus finds his bride. Where heaven and earth come together. When Jesus finds the desire of his heart. Father, will you find a, a house that is prepared for you? Lord Jesus, we know that you want to live with us. You said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you can be always. Lord, you so told us that your priority, even for this weekend, was John 17. That they would be in us and us in them that they may be perfected in unity. And Lord Jesus, I just want to pray into that. I want to agree with you that we want to be perfected in your great love and your unity. We want to be drawn into your divine purposes. 
We want to make places in our hearts, all the rooms of our heart to be, all the doors to be open. We want, we pray for the keys to unlock every door, to unlock every heart, to unlock our minds, to, to set us free from the limitations of tradition and release us into the liberty of the sons of God, to the law of liberty, the law of love, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which sets us free from the law of sin and death. We pray for the new boundaries of the new creation. I ask you, Father, to establish in us, by the word of God, frame in us the new boundaries of the new creation. Set our minds free from restrictions which are not in Christ. But set us in the yoke of Jesus. To this one will I look. To him who is humble and contrite and who trembles at my word. Lord, please look at us. May we tremble under your word today. May we tremble in Christ. May we submit to the eternal which is in you. And Lord, I just confess to you that my own heart binds me up. It holds me back. Father, I pray for the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ. Lord, put your sword in our hearts and cut away by a circumcision made without hands all that hinders and all that restricts. I pray for that circumcision that is made without hands.
We thank you, Father, for your ability to navigate us into the mysteries of Jesus. Draw us into that fellowship, Lord. May we abide in him. May our purposes unfold before us. Your purposes in us. And may we cease to be about us and only become about you. Have your way, Lord. Have your way the rest of this day. Have your way, Lord, in us. Gather us to yourself. In Jesus' name. I give.